Well, hi, everybody. It's Jeff Slakey here on The Daybreak Show, and I've got a great guest in the green room here to talk about a book and an upcoming talk in Tumwater. It's Mike Fredson. Hello, Mike. How you doing? Hey, how are you doing? We've got logging in Mason County, 1946 to 1985. Uh, you are a, a longtime author here in the community. About seven books you've published about Mason County. Seven books from our... Uh, original settlement of the county all the way up to 1986 and contemporary times and times that I lived in. Thursday the 11th you're going to be at the Schmidt House in Tumwater talking about this book, Logging in Mason County, and talking with the Olympia Tumwater Foundation and Don Trosper. We've had some conversations with him about the upcoming speech and it uh, sounds like it's going to be a lot of fun and uh, get a, a real good chance to explain and talk to the folks in Olympia and the area about logging in Mason County. What can you tell us about the book, what you learned about the book, and, and what you'll share on Thursday? I, I, I'm, of course, born in 1948, which makes me wholly a member of the Sustained Yield and how we lived, and, and, uh, and I didn't really grasp it until, of course, it's over and I grow up, but it, it's a, it was a post-World War II program that was really responding to the needs of the veterans, that, that they all, they had won a war, they deserve to celebrate, they deserve to have jobs, they deserve to be able to come home to have families, to be able to um, uh, reap the rewards of, of their, their successful war effort. And, and in Shelton, in Mason County, we have logging, and, and it, the logging community is, of course, uh, it's, it's gone over 100 years. I, I, I say it took 100 years to uh, log Mason County from Tidewater to the top of the mountains, starting in the 1880s with, with three railroads that came right in here uh, and, and then extended to uh, post-World War II. At, in, in the 1940s, Simpson had almost used up all their, their timber uh, and... Uh, and when the veterans came back, they would have been without a job in the community. And, and uh, fortunately, uh, the government under uh, Franklin Roosevelt had uh, created plans to be able to find jobs, to be able to create jobs in natural resource-based communities like Shelton. And so uh, for a long period of time, from 1918 to 1941, the government um, kind of uh, struggled with how we were going to handle the timber. And in after in 1946, uh, the government and Simpson came to an agreement where Simpson would put in 158,000 acres, and the U.S. Forest Service would put in 111,000 acres, and together they called it the Shelton Cooperative Sustained Yield Community, and the effort was to create a community that would sustain itself, that uh, the logging would go on for 40 years or 30 years on Forest Service ground with old growth, and then after that would be cut, then they'd return to the 158,000 plus acres that Simpson had, which were already been cut over, and but but had turned into and note the language here into a tree farm, so they would grow timber. So when the old growth was cut, then they'd come back down to the lowlands, start cutting timber there, and to be able to sustain uh, a community, to be able to sustain our community. It sounds like one of those public private partnerships everybody's talking about nowadays was started here 1946 or so it, it, it's a great try the, the government um post-world war ii uh some of the uh representatives recognized what a great job mark reed had done who is the president of simpson from 19 14 or something like that to his death in 1933 how he developed the community uh, uh, created a community of, of modern community with with a hospital that he built with a high school that he built with a road that he built to Shelton um, and, and they liked the way he treated his his employees not as someone to to use up but someone to 
work for the company, stay in the community, raise their families. And so what they tried to do was do it over uh, the nation. And they sent out solicitations uh, to 52 different watersheds. Uh, some of them came back uh, as possibles. And in fact, they created four or five of them throughout the uh, nation, but they generally failed because they, they were not public-private uh, communities. They were only using public timber to create private jobs. So you are back on the Historical Society board as the president. Is this where you get most of the information for your books through the Historical Society and the museum in town, or is it primary sources that you have found over the years? Or Great question. And I want to answer it in a couple of ways. First, the Historical Society is an important integral member of our community that people bring stuff into the society. They bring photographs in. They bring their own family records in. And, and we serve as a repository for our community, for our families. People will come back to the Historical Society and, and review their family stuff and be able to see pictures of their grandparents, pictures of, of their houses and, and what they did. And, and so I use a lot of that. But also, um, in, in this particular case, I was really lucky because I, one of the people that I ended up meeting, her name was Stephanie Neal. She worked for the Forest Service. She happened to be the granddaughter of Irene Davis, who was one of the founding members of the Historical Society. And she had all, she knew were almost all of the records the U.S. Forest Service had. They would boxed them up and put them in a closet in Olympia and hadn't opened them for 40 years. Wow. And so she arranged for me to be able to uh, review all those records by telling her bosses that I was just gonna, I, I'm just going to take notes on what's in the boxes. And uh -huh. so I was able to go through, and the first box I opened up was the final litigation on the closing of it, which was amazing. And but through it, I, I was I was luck I was lucky to be able to see how the Forest Service handled the um, uh, relationship with Simpson. And then, of course, I used a lot of the Simpson material uh, for for uh, to contribute from the Simpson point of view. And and then uh, the IWA is an important member in this uh, kind of a disenfranchised member from it uh, in, in the end, but uh, they they were able to contribute because they lived through it, and, and they were our families. I, I, I love part of the, and this is kind of an aside, but the boss of Simpson, his name was Chris Kreinbaum, and he had a ha house up on Hillcrest. Well, when he sold the house, <laughs> the guy who bought it <coughs> after a while was the head of the union, which I thought was a terrific uh, comment on how our community wasn't so disparately um, uh, financed that, that the head of the union makes enough money to buy the house that the boss of Simpson was, be, was wow. lived in. So things have changed since. But in, in those days, it was a community that was recovering from the war and we're cover, recovering together. Let's talk about your speech, your talk on Thursday at the Schmidt House in Olympia. It's right in the shadow there of the brewery. And again, folks encouraged to show up early. 1130 is when the doors are going to open. And in uh, times past, they've had to shut the doors because there's not enough room. And I have a feeling this conversation will be one of those. What are you going to uh, go over for the folks there? I, I'm, I'm going to chat about the historic uh record of the of this book the sustained yield i i believe that um it's the it's a unique experience experiment in the uh, united states of uh, forestry as well as how to create communities and and so here we have one that was formed out of the chaos of world war ii to create communities that would make veterans feel like they're at home. I, I'm going to talk about how it was formed through through 40 years of uh, led, federal legislation and almost uh, socialism uh, as we went through the, the Depression. I'm going to talk about uh, how, it, how it was organized, how it, how it um, 
impacted Shelton, for instance. We had, in the end, we had new schools. We had um, new industries uh, to hire enough people. The rule was they had to provide, a for, with, they got to cut 100 million board feet. They were supposed to supply 1,000 jobs for 100 years. That was the goal of the sustained yield. And to do that, uh, Simpson actually bought McClary and, and, and restored the door plant there, uh, built a hospital here. They built IBP. I worked at IBP. I'm sure there are people who are still alive at IB from working there. Uh, they uh, moved into the uh, camps with Camp Grisdale, which is uh, legendary in its uh, positioning as the last live-in logging camp in the continental United States, and the people from Grisdale still love, still love Grisdale. I I'm going to talk about how um, it uh, impacted the locals, that they created uh, recreational facilities. The Simpson Recreational Association uh, did the Simpson Rec out at Mason Lake, that they had fishing uh, derbies, they had golf tournaments, they had uh, bridge tournaments, they had bowling. For me, I, I got to be a 13-year-old star playing baseball, <laughs> which was fun. And, and, uh, uh, we, and, and all those things created a community that was really isolated unto itself uh, because we had a cut we had to make and so people had to stay hired and, and and so the community sustained itself without a lot of input from from outside and over that period of time uh, it lasted 40 years uh, uh, the community kind of grew into itself and and didn't necessarily have to reach out uh, into other communities. Sounds like it's going to be a great conversation again. It's going to be Thursday the 11th at the Schmidt House in Tumwater as part of the Olympia Tumwater Foundation's uh, monthly conversations. Mike Fred's in here. The book again, Logging in Mason County, 1946 to 1985. You can get this at the uh, museum here in Shelton, right? This okay. and all the books, right? That's right. I encourage everybody to go visit the museum, Fifth and Railroad. We've got a large selection of books, not only the seven that I've written, but books about Belfair, books about Allen, books about Great View, the books about Tawana. Um, and so I encourage visitations there, and I encourage everybody to join the museum, be be part of be part of Shelton's history and join. Mikey, it was good talking to you again.